Well, good evening. God's peace to God's people this night as we gather. And it's hard to believe as the sun gets, seems like it gets darker every week, but we are here with the light of Christ that lightens our way and turns us to the ever-living God, as we'll hear more about tonight. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, we will have All Saints is coming up, hard to believe. Uh, that will be November 1st. It actually falls on a Sunday this year. Uh, so the Thursday beforehand and the Sunday of uh, All Saints will have that service. So if you've had any loved ones this past year who have gone on to be with the Lord and wait their resurrection, uh, please let us know. We have all the records from those that we uh, did funerals for this past year that we're entering in. But if you have family members, please let us know so we can have that in as part of the memorial during that day. It's kind of like the, uh, the coming home, all the saints come marching in as we remember what God has done for us. Uh, also, speaking of that, that weekend... Uh, council told me to take a vacation, uh, so I will be taking one on October 29th, that's that Thursday, uh, through November 4th. Uh, Pastor Mark will be filling in at Thursday and Sunday, as well as doing Bible class on Sunday, uh, so he's looking forward to that, and we'll have him here uh, for that week, so uh, thanks be to God for that. Uh, we'll enjoy that time, but if you have any emergencies or things that come up, please let the office know. Uh, and they'll get you connected to Pastor Mark or any pastor that's available during that time. Uh, also, Advent's coming up a little bit earlier this year. Uh, we'll, you'll see in the back on your way out on the table, there's little pur purple devotionals for Advent. Uh, feel free to take one. The theme this year is for singing and song and how it relates to the Word of God and salvation. Uh, so take a look at that on your way out. Grab some of those. You can also find them on the app or online as well. If you want a digital copy and follow along there, you can do that. Uh, in the ancient church, when Advent first came around in the 4th and 5th centuries, it was seven weeks long. Uh, and a few hundred years later on, it was shortened down to four like we're used to now. Uh, so we wanted to go back, maybe do that little ancient tradition and have that. Plus, we got cheated out of Lent this year, uh, halfway through. And plus, Advent is a season of hope. Uh, and I thought it would be good to have a few extra weeks to focus in on the hope that God has called us to in Christ and to focus on that as we end the year on that note. Um, of course, on Sunday, October 18th, will be our congregational meeting. It'll be after the 9 a.m. service. They'll be right in here. Uh, we will have the FM transmitter on, so those of you who may want to be out in the parking lot and listening in, we'll have that. We'll still have ballots we can run out to you. Uh, so that'll be available if you just want to be able to sit and listen and be a part, but maybe not. you don't want to be in here for that. So that will be available uh, for those of you uh, who might be listening on the Sunday morning beforehand. I think that's all I have. We give thanks to God this night. He comes at us with his word and with his gifts. And we will begin by singing our opening hymn, hymn number 905, Come Thou Almighty King.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, the Lord, is a little sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in his stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now with the introit. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your heart. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and forevermore. Glory, Glory be to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. We continue with the Kyrie. Let's pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, 
have mercy on us, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our scripture lessons this night. Our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 45th chapter. Thus says the Lord, who is anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our psalm as we repeat responsibly. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Our epistle lesson this night comes from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Alleluia and the Gospel. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk, and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, 
and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. Let's now confess our faith together in who our God is by speaking the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, hymn 940, Holy God, we praise thy name. We'll sing at the final stanza.
be seated. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, this sermon today is preached not only on my behalf as your pastor, but also from our DCE, Tammy, our elders, our church council, our office manager, and the rest of our staff. This is from all of us who labor over you in love. Amen. To the church in Marshfield, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. As Paul writes, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait from his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, this Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, dating-wise, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is the earliest book written in the New Testament, most likely written around 51 A.D. So before any of the Gospels were put ink to paper, before any of other of the Paul's letters were written, 1 Thessalonians is the first New Testament book to be put down on paper. And from it, Paul gives us a good reminder, an encouragement, and a warning that as the people of God living today, we would be wise to pay attention to. Our lesson from Thessalonians reminds us of the power of the Word of God. Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God made flesh, whose power saves us from the wrath that is to come. It also encourages us to see and live out the fruits of faith, of joy, of love, and of peace, hope, that spring forth from God's word. And finally, it warns us that if we should turn from God's word and instead listen to the words of idols, that that wrath that comes upon those idols will also result upon us as well. But before we get too much into all of that, Paul's letters are always better understood once you see why Paul is writing. You see, St. Paul is a missionary, an apostle, going from town to town, starting churches to each of the towns that he goes into, appointing leaders in those churches, and then he would leave and go to the next town. And then on his way back through, he would go back through all the towns where he started churches, and he would visit the brothers and sisters in the faith and check in on them to see how they were doing, these churches that he has started. During Paul's second missionary journey, which you can go and read about in Acts chapter 17, Paul comes to the city of Thessalonica. It's a city nestled on the eastern shores of Greece. And when Paul gets there, he begins his stay by going into the synagogue and preaching and teaching concerning Jesus Christ. And people are converted. Especially, we're told, a large number of Greeks, non-Jews, Gentiles, and a small church is founded. But something happens that just throws everything off. Paul and Silas are only in the city of Thessalonica for three Sabbath days, three weeks, before the unbelieving Jews become jealous that there are Greeks turning to God and becoming Christians. And so we're told in Acts chapter 17 that these unbelieving Jews rouse the wicked people in the city among the rabble, and they form a mob, they start a riot, they attack a leading member of the church named Jason, and they proceed to have him thrown into jail. And then they mount a manhunt to see if they can find Paul and his companion Silas and kill them. In response to all of these events that suddenly overtake the city, these new believers, this small little church, they take Paul and Silas by night and usher them out of the city because they do not want to see them dead. You know, Paul, he's not someone who cares about himself or whether he lives or dies. In fact, Paul probably would have stayed in the city if it wasn't for this repeated admonition of his disciples to no, please go. So only three weeks of teaching and training. These new Christians are now without a leader and without someone to teach them about Jesus or how this faith in Christ is lived out. Now stop here and imagine this for a second. Many of you have been Christians for decades. You know, or at least should have known or heard, the stories of the Bible year after year now. You know the beliefs, the doctrines, the lifestyles of our faith very well. But imagine that this Christianity is a whole new concept for you. You've never heard about Christianity, Jesus Christ, who is that? You don't know the story of the Bible. 
You don't know about the birth of Jesus. You don't know his life, his miracles, his teachings, his passion, his death, his resurrection. These are foreign concepts to you. You don't know anything. Now imagine that you only have three weeks to learn it all. You only get to hear three sermons because Paul has had only three Sabbaths to teach and preach. Imagine you only had 21 days to come and visit the pastor, talk and learn and grow before everything was swept under the rug and pulled out from underneath you. So as St. Paul is being evacuated out of the city, away from people who have just barely begun to hear about Jesus, what do you think he's worried about? He's worried about about what any pastor or teacher would rightly be worried about. Namely, that these new believers in Jesus Christ will not make it. Paul fears that like the parable of the sower that Jesus teaches, where these believers will be like the seed that's planted in the rocks, and it quickly springs up, but once the sun comes up, these plants wither and die because they have no lasting root, and they die. Paul's worried that these new Christians will fall back into their old ways or give way under the persecution because the riot hasn't left the town and then renounce the name of Jesus Christ. So, as soon as Paul can, Paul sends Timothy to travel back to Thessalonica to go and visit this congregation to see how they're doing and to see if there's any Christians left, right? Timothy's mission is a, is anyone out there? Kind of mission. And Paul is hoping that he's going to hear some good news. Well, Paul is left pleasantly surprised and stunned. He hears back from Timothy, all right, but before he even hears back from Timothy, it's not only him, but he hears also from Christians who are hundreds of miles away in Macedonia and Achaia that the congregation in Thessalonica is not only still there, but boldly speaking and proclaiming Jesus Christ. In fact, they're doing it so well that they're setting the example for Christians in towns nearby, and they've only had three weeks' worth of training in Christian formation to boot to get it all done. How is this possible? Why are these Thessalonians so bold? For Paul, the first ten verses of our lesson today spells it out. It was the Word of God that did this, nothing else. Paul spends this entire lesson tonight thanking God for the faith and for the Christians in Thessalonica, but hidden in verses 5, 6, and 8, Paul states that it is the Word of God that has accomplished their steadfastness, their hope, their joy, and their love for Jesus Christ. This is the word of God that has come in the power of the gospel, he writes, by the Holy Spirit and brought them to full conviction to those who believe. He writes that they have received the word despite persecution and threats and have become imitators of Paul and the Lord and set the example. And then he continues on in verse 8, that they have returned, sounding the word of God forth like a trumpet, to all the lands surrounding them. Paul is so amazed that he says that their faith in God has gone forth so well that it's reported to Paul that he doesn't need to even add anything to what they're saying. Now, Paul could be tempted to think that he's a good teacher, but he knows better. It is the word of God. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has turned them. And in only three weeks' worth of time, of teachings night and day, only three public sermons in the synagogue, the Word of God has inflicted its healing power. Paul teaches us the gospel here tonight. Namely, that people were turned, which is the same word in Greek for repent. That these believers repented from idols, and they turned instead to the true and living God. And now they're waiting for his Son from heaven, this Jesus Christ, whom God has raised from the dead, this same Jesus, Paul notes, who will deliver you from the wrath that is to come. It is the Word that has done it, and that's the point. It is Jesus Christ who has caused this turning to God away from idols. 
It is the same Jesus who has caused faith to spring up and love to abound. And it is this Jesus who I now turn to you as well this night. This congregation will soon be tested. If not already, then it will for sure come. No doubt our meeting coming up this weekend at our councils and our boards, it will appear. We deceive ourselves if we think it will not come, this temptation. So it is prudent that we prepare ourselves for when it does. The temptation is this, that the Word of God is not enough. Too often, the church feels the need to turn herself away from the true and living God and instead run after idols. Idols, what are they? What do they look like? What do they sound like? Well, they have similar names, but they sound like this. My passions, my choices, my truth, my preferences, my body, my life, my vision, my health, my security. Are you getting it? These idols are whatever we turn to serve instead of the transforming power of God's word. These idols are false and dead. And they are an offense to the true and living God because idols pretend to be gods. For the one true God, he alone. There is no other, as we heard from our prophet Isaiah. There is no other. That's what makes him true. He alone is the living one because only from him comes the source of life for all beings. So, when people put their trust in that which pretends to be God, the true God gets mad, just like you would be if you found out that someone had stolen your identity and was going around doing things in your name and taking credit for the things that you had earned and done. So, God has a solution to these idols. You see, God has appointed a day, a day that he will cause his anger to burn against all idols, a day which he will ransack his creation, drag these idols out and burn them until they are no more, until he alone remains God. But, tragically, those who have idols will be destroyed along with their idols. Those who cling and serve to that which is false and dead will also end up like the idols they serve. That is the eternal wrath that is to come, that Paul makes note in the very last word of our lesson. And God will cause all of creation to experience it. But Paul reminds us that this same God has a son, and his name is Jesus. And God the Father is not content to have you or I die with these idols. So he sent his son to save you from your sins, to free you from these idols, and to turn you instead to the true and living God. This is the good news that was preached to the Thessalonians, to which they believed, and to which they turned to God through Christ, and to which now you do too. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the day is coming, coming soon. God's wrath will burn away all that is false. God will leave no stone unturned, no heart unsearched. All will be revealed and undone. But on that day, when it comes... Jesus will come again. Jesus will come on that day, and Jesus alone will save you from that wrath. So, when the flames touch you on that day, they will not burn you away. They will rather cleanse you. The fires of judgment day will carry away all the dross and purge you of the impurities because you trust in the word of God that is spoken to you again today. Because you believe in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God the Father is not willing to let his own son remain dead, but raised him from the grave. And therefore he will do the same to you. You who trust in the ever-living one. Jesus will save you, take you, and he will show you off to his Father as one for whom he died and saved. Jesus will save you. You can take it to the bank Jesus has already cashed the check. 
This is the word that has been preached to you, is it not? Isn't this the gospel of Jesus Christ to which you were baptized into? Is this not the table that you come and partake of this night? Is this not what you have risked? Despite COVID and threats of loss of safety and health, to receive and hear again in person this day. Because the word of God has transformed your hearts. It has filled you with hope, has ignited the passion of love and faith in Christ and for your neighbor, and has inspired you with full conviction in the Holy Spirit that this Jesus has saved you, and he will again appear on that day to save you from that wrath on that terrible and awesome day. If this is true, and indeed it is, then with Paul I give thanks to God that you have received the word of God and you will prove true because of him who is true. And because of that, you will face the temptation that will soon come upon us. You will continue to return, uh, repent and turn from idols to the living God. Do not put your hope into church programs, ideas, visions, preferences. If you think there is a silver bullet that will magically solve all of our problems, then you're going to be hunting after an idol. If we as a congregation fall to the temptation to seek after that which is false and dead, then in the end we will become like them. So, we as your church leaders and servants implore you, seek after the true and living God, the one who has sent his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to save you. Seek him only in the word and in his sacraments. Do not throw your hope in man or in his ideas or in commodity or preference. You'll end up being disappointed every single time, or you'll end up much worse because of it. Become imitators of us and the Lord, as Paul says, so that you will receive the word of God in any affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that we set the tone, that we will be the example for all believers, not only here in Marshfield, but for central Wisconsin and for those hundreds of miles around. This is done by hearing, receiving, and trusting only in the word of God. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ has paid them. There's the word from God to you today. It is only the word of God that can transform us and lead us boldly where God would have us go. God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. That transforming word of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who will save you from that wrath that is to come. Amen. Let us now continue by singing to our God, uh, let's see, uh, our clo uh, returning hymn, Offertory, Create in Me. join your hearts together with mine as we lift our prayers up before God, who is our Father. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word, the transforming power of your word that calls us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, that turns us from our idols and our vain ways into your way, to your truth. Lord, we give thanks for this. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you be with all the churches here in town, scattered throughout the world, that all of us as believers may call upon you, who is the true and ever-living one. Be with pastors and teachers in your church. Be with our seminaries and colleges and, the, and our Christian day schools. That those who learn and those who teach may ever grow stronger in your word. Lord, in your mercy. 
Be with our congregation here at Christ Lutheran Church. Be with our members. Be with all of our leaders. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Grant us your direction. Grant us your wisdom. That we may not act as the world acts, but as your people have been called to act through all the ages. Lord, in your mercy. Give strength to our world. A world that is hurting and broken and in shattered pieces that we may turn to you. Lord, be with our leaders, those who are authorities over us, our president, our governor, our local magistrates, those who judge our laws, those who make them, and those who enforce them, that we as people may have common life and live in peace and love with our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. We come before you to all those whose life is in danger, or those who face any difficulty, those who are under threat by persecution, those who are forgotten by our society. We be with those who are sick, especially be with our doctors and nurses and those who are, respond to emergencies, that they may be doing the best care to their ability. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up to you this night all those who have asked for our prayers in this congregation. Lord, we give thanks for all those who celebrate life, for birthdays, for marriages, for family, that these good gifts that you have given to us, that we may not throw them away, but receive them with gladness. Lord, in your mercy. For those mourning the loss of loved ones, for those who are in any need, that you would comfort us with your gospel, remind us of your salvation, and give us the hope of the resurrection to life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. For all these prayers and whatever else that you know that we need, deliver us from evil, that we may be protected from all of this and rejoice in your saving name. Lord, in your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will a cappella the ending of this service here tonight. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. We close now with our closing hymn, hymn number 13, Rejoice, O Pilgrim Throng. <laughs>